I invite you to find the book of Philippians chapter 1, and we are going to finish chapter 1 today. All right, Philippians chapter 1. Um, we're engaged in a series called Joy and Laughter. You never can have too much. You can only have too little. We have been investigating the book of Philippians because it is the book of joy out of the scriptures. It talks about it in every chapter. It's the main thrust that Paul wanted to emphasize the church at Philippi. And as we have said every week, the added thrust of joy in this book is that Paul wrote these words while incarcerated in Rome. He didn't write this from a cruise ship or a penthouse. He wrote it while incarcerated. And so if you can have joy in the face of that kind of adversity, then it gives us hope that you and I can experience joy in the face of our own adversities. As Paul opens up chapter 1, he sort of sets a framework of, of, of what he wants to say to, uh, to his friends and the members of the church at Philippi. And he basically starts out with what's necessary in order for you and I to experience joy and adversity as not only an individual child of God, but also as a member of his family called the church. And Paul lets them know in those first few verses what those key ingredients are. He says, I have you in mind. He says, I have you in my heart. And he says, I have you in my prayers. That's essential for a church family. It's essential for us individually. It's critical for us collectively. It's, it's, I know a lot of times you think the reason for the bulletin is so you can know uh, what's going to happen in church today. Well, do you realize in this bulletin it's that much that's going to happen in church today? Everything else in here is about how you can engage with the family and the community of God. And I think for me the most important section is this page right here which has prayer requests. And then if you'll see up here, where you could be taking sermon notes, obviously I'm not going to say much. They only gave you six lines. <laughs> but it's a great place to do the add-ons that I share on Sunday mornings that we find out more about from the time it's printed here. This is of most value because this is what enables you to keep each other in mind, in heart, and in your prayers. This is what connects us. It's one of those things that connects us together. Paul then goes on to talk about a variety of things, but where we've been these last, um, these last few verses are those prerequisites to experiencing joy in the face of adversity. We've also discovered who we are in Jesus Christ because Paul talks a lot about this in chapter 1. I, I asked third service last week. I asked first service this week. I got very disappointing answers. I'm not expecting more from you all today. <laughs> but I'll ask you all in this service. How many of you have Googled Who I Am in Christ by Neil Anderson since I talked about it two weeks ago? One, two, yo, looky there, six in this, or seven in this service. All right, that uh, doubles the other two services combined. All right. <laughs> So you all get the award today. Uh, uh, yes, I could copy this and have it available and hand it out to you, but that's kind of like still spoon feeding you. So I'm going to challenge you one more week. It's easy to do. Unless you don't have a computer or don't Google at all, then call me and I'll print you a copy. But if you have access, Google Who I Am in Christ by Neil Anderson. It's one page. You ought to put that in the flyleaf of your Bible. Take another one, put it up somewhere on a mirror where you can see it on a daily basis until you know those truths inside and out. On that singular page, Neil Anderson has done a great job of telling us who we are in Christ. And it starts out with, I am accepted in Christ. And there's about eight passages of Scripture and what you and I can know about our acceptance in Christ. The middle part of that page is, I am secure in Christ. And again, about a dozen Scripture verses with it where that security, how that security in Christ impacts us in life. 
life. And then the last portion of that page is I am significant in Christ. And it outlines our significance. I am salt. I am light. I am a branch of the true vine. I am God's temple. I am God's ambassador. I can do all things through Christ. And it gives you the scripture verse. And the things on that page, if you can arm yourselves with that one page, what a difference it will make in the way in which you live your Christian life. It's, it's an easy way to get the most essential truths in your mind and in your hearts and in your prayers. So one more time, Who I Am in Christ by Neil Anderson. It will pop up right away, all right? And so then we began to look at the three priorities, all right, for victory in a life of adversity. And uh, last week we looked at being consistent, all right? And um, last week we talked a little bit about being consistent. Three very simple things. And, and these, these are simple, but they're essential, and it's why I'm reiterating them again today. These are new habits that you need to willfully choose to create in your life. I bet if I ask 90% of you, what do you do when you first wake up in the morning? I bet there would be a consistent pattern every single day for 90% of you. Is that right? You get up and do the same thing. You have a habit for how you start your day. It is hard. And, and it's not that what you're doing right now is a bad habit, but maybe you don't think you have room for a good habit. But when we need to add a good habit into our life, it has to be willful and thoughtful. And we sometimes need accountability, all right, to help us out. Um, how many of you take vitamins or medication on a daily basis? Okay, vast majority of us. Okay, all right. Here's here's the deal. I, uh, up up until just uh, very very recently, I, I was I was free of medication. All right, I take a few now, and so I I can't believe that I've reached the age where I have a pill box. <laughs> Any of you all have a pill box? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay. And, and when I first started doing this, I had my little bottles, which is a combination of vitamins and one, one medication. And, and I had them all lined up in the pantry. And, and, and you know what? Sometimes I never opened the pantry door in the mornings. It wasn't my habit. And so I got to where I, I, I bought the pill box and I put them in and I set them in the middle of the counter that I couldn't help but see when I go to make my first habit of the day my cup of coffee. And so I would set them out at night. And before we would go to bed, Shelly would see the pillbox out on the counter and she would put them away. <laughs> Be because that's her habit, all right? Clean, clean. And so I had to, and so we had to have a little conversation, all right? So that until this became an ingrained habit for me, all right, I needed, I needed something. That I had to work at creating a new habit. If if you have high blood pressure and it's been diagnosed by your doctor and he says, if you take this little tiny pill once a day, it will keep your blood pressure under control, your heart healthier, and you will live longer. What would you do? You would create a new habit, right? You would take that pill. You would get the prescription. You would go to the effort to go to the farm. You would do the steps necessary because it is good for you. There are three new habits every single one of us as believers in Christ need to have in our life. And the promise is greater than a blood pressure pill. The benefits are eternal. They are present and eternal, but they are essential. If you just buy the prescription and put it on the counter and never take it, does it help you? Same thing is true with a Bible. Just buying one, just getting one free from the welcome cart, it won't help you. Three 
consistent habits need to be developed. Number one, you must be consistent in Bible reading and Bible study. You must be, or you will always be a weak, anemic Christian, moved more by your emotions than you will be by truth. I'm not asking you to become a biblical scholar, but I am asking you to get a working knowledge of God's Word. Know that Genesis is in the Old Testament and John is in the New Testament. Put some Bible verses in your head, even if you can't remember the address, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. It is a gift that comes from God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want we need to get those here and here so they do some good out here. And if we don't, we will always be weak and anemic, moved and tossed by winds of heresy and false truths. It's essential. Want a couple of suggestions if you don't know where to start? How about starting with a daily devotional? I'll recommend two. My utmost for his highest. It's the all-time classic. I think it's, it, it may be the singular best daily devotional that's ever been written. My utmost for his highest. Oswald Chambers is the author. Uh, Jesus Calling, another really, really good, good daily devotional. Written by Sarah. Sarah yeah, thank you. What's the last name? Young. Young. Okay, Sarah Young. You want to get a little bit meatier? It's not a daily devotional. But it's divided into 52 short chapters. So one a week, and you can gnaw on one chapter all week. It's called The Indwelling Life of Christ by Major Ian Thomas. If I was going to be stranded on an island for 10 years and I could only have two books with me, one would be the Bible and the other would be The Indwelling Life of Christ by Major Ian Thomas. Essential. Essential. Start there. Next, you must be consistent in prayer. It's discovering more about yourself as you talk to God. And then last of all, consistent in the fellowship of believers. All right, let's jump in where we're going to be today. Beginning at verse 27. Whatever happens, that's anything that happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you later or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one person. So he's talking now to the whole church at Philippi. As a group, I want you to move as one. Without being frightened in any way, by those who oppose you or those things that confront you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but you will be saved. And that by God. Not by your own ingenuity, not by your force of character or personality. The salvation comes from God himself, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to suffer for him. We don't like that part. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now here, that I still have. What does God want from us? There were three wealthy sons. They had all grown up, been raised by their mother, loved her very much. They all grew up to be very, very successful men. Her birthday was rolling around, and these three brothers always tried to one-up each other for their mother's birthday presents. This year, the oldest son said to his two brothers, I got you both beat. I bought mom a brand new two-story home. Bigger and better than anything she could have ever hoped or imagined for. And the second one said, well, older brother, you may have done good, but you know what? I bought mom a brand new Rolls Royce, and I have provided a chauffeur for her. Be here for her beck and call 24-7. And the third son said, I've got you both beat. You know how much mom loves God's word and her vision is going bad and she can't read much anymore? 
I bought mom a parrot that was trained at a monastery that can quote every verse of the Bible. I had to commit $100,000 a year for the next 10 years to that monastery, but mom, all she has to do is give book, chapter, and verse, and that parrot will quote the scripture to her. After they gave mom their gifts, a week passed, and mom sent each of them a thank you note. She wrote to her older son, Son, that house you gave me is too big. I don't have time to clean it all. She wrote to her second son, Son, that car you gave me just sits in the garage. I don't ever go anywhere, and that driver, he eats me out of house and home, and he's just downright rude. <laughs> to the baby boys who always know what's right to do, for those of you who don't know, I am the baby son, all right? And to her, she wrote these words. She wrote to him these words. Son, you just know what a mother likes. The chicken was delicious. So, so Remember, this is on joy and laughter, all right? So we had to get a little laughter to get some joy. So the question is, do we know and understand what the Father likes? Paul tries to tell us in this passage. You see, in this passage, um, we, we can say it positively or negatively. The positive way is one of the three prerequisites to a life filled with joy in the face of adversity. Negatively, we can say, what are the three things that will steal our joy? The three things that steal our joy is a lack of good conduct, of consistency, and that's a behavioral problem. That's strictly a behavior problem. Choosing not to get up 30 minutes earlier in the morning if I can't move something else around on my schedule to study God's Word. Um, I, you could study the Bible morning, noon, or night, all right? My personal recommendation is don't start at night. Because what do we have a tendency to do when we read at night? Yeah. All right, so um, if you're a night out, great. But for most of you, find another time during the day. But that's a behavioral problem. A lack of cooperation, both vertical and horizontal cooperation, dependent upon him vertically and embracing each other horizontally. If there's a lack of cooperation, that's a relational issue. And if you've got a relational problem, you, you need to talk to him about this one and maybe you need to ask forgiveness in this one. And maybe you need to give it. Maybe it's been asked for, but you haven't given it. And then a lack of courage. That's an irrational problem. It usually exists between our ears. It's, it's making mountains out of molehills. It's, um, it's thinking of big scary monsters when something goes bump in the night. It's usually irrational. Last week, we spent all of our time looking at that consistency. Today, let's jump in and talk about being cooperative. Most of all, Paul wished that the Philippians to understand that they would not be able to really survive their pressures on their own. Often when people are under pressure, it's easy to lose sight of the importance of being together, standing together, and being united. We must stand fast and strong in the Lord, is what Paul says. But we would need to do so while joining hands with each other. Paul sounded the challenge to stand fast as a church, not just to the letter that he wrote to the Philippians, but he said it to the Corinthians and the Galatians and the Thessalonians. To the Corinthians he wrote, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. To the Galatians he wrote, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And to the Thessalonians, he wrote, Thessal, yeah, yeah, those guys. He said, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the teachings which you were taught from the word out of my epistle. Winston Churchill once wrote about General Tudor, the British commander of a division facing the Germans in an assault in March of 1918. He wrote, the impression I had of Tudor was an iron peg hammered into the frozen ground, absolutely immovable. In the war, the odds were heavily against him. 
But Tador knew how to meet an apparently irresistible force. He merely stood his ground and let the force expend its energy against him. And that is how Paul wanted his friends in Philippi to respond to the pressures of adversity around them. Let the force of the enemy just blow its energy as you stand firm in the truth. But you see, in order to stand firm in the face of adversity, we need to have our lives anchored to something. Anchored to the solid rock of God's truth. Otherwise, we get blown around by the force of the adversity. But we need to be rooted in God's word. While the apostle was concerned about the attitude of believer towards those who were outside the fellowship, he was also concerned about the love of the believers inside the fellowship. He shares this concern two more times in the book of Philippians, in chapter 2 and in chapter 4, but this is also a concern that he shares in almost all of the letters that he writes to other churches. He did it in both the Corinthian letters. He does it to the church at Galatia. He does it in the book of Ephesians. When he instructed the people at Philippi to strive together, understand something, that word strive together is not strife together. Two different concepts. Strife is we're fighting with each other. Strive together means we are all going in the same direction together. English poet and novelist Rudyard Kipling penned a verse that visualizes this. Um, I understand it's probably not a politically correct poem today. But he conveys a powerful truth here when he talks about the law of the jungle. Now this is the law of the jungle as old and as true as the sky. And the wolf that keeps it may prosper. And the wolf that shall break it must die. As the creeper that girds the tree trunk, the law runneth forward and back. And the strength of the pack is the wolf. And the strength of the wolf is the pack. Kipley was on to something. You might not like the idea of being compared to a wolf or a pack, but the visual is right on the target. You see, when it comes to standing for truth in times of pressure, the law of the jungle must be in force. For the strength of the church is each Christian. And the strength of the Christian is the church. You and I are not intended to be lone ranger Christians. You see, one of Satan's favorite tactics is to divide and conquer he knows that if he gets us fighting amongst ourselves within the church, then the church is weakened and made ineffective in their ability to communicate the love and the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last week I played an old song for you. I could have played this old song this week, but I got something else to show you in a minute. But, but do you all remember a, a group called the Brotherhood of Man in the 70s? They were a one-hit wonder. And I'm going to give you the one-hit wonder. You'll remember it when I give you the words. For united we stand, divided we fall. And if our backs are ever against the wall, we will be together. Together. You and I. Interesting. Paul wrote that song thousands of years before the brotherhood of man did. It is together. With this in mind, Paul called for unity, togetherness, and cooperation. We are to be inseparable. Just as in a vertical relationship, Jesus says to us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We are inseparable with him. When this vertical relationship is in force, then it ought to also impact our horizontal relationships. And you and I ought to be together as inseparable because we are bound with Jesus Christ. He calls for us to stand firm in this one spirit. And then he envisioned them so unified that they would move and contend as if they were just one person. When we are truly working as a team, there is power and synchronization. How do you like that? Synchronization. That's a two-bit word, man. I don't know if we fully appreciate what Paul's talking about here. I'm going to 
have them play um, my least favorite Olympic sport. And though it is my least favorite Olympic sport, I watch it almost every year because I'm amazed at how they work together. Maybe better than any other team sport in Olympic history. Let's watch it. Is that not amazing? I can't stand the sport, but I'm mystified by it because of the way in which you can turn it off now. We've seen enough bathing suits. Um, I tried to find them in full body gear, but I couldn't find one. Uh, I find it amazing, the unity, the cooperation, the, the work they do together. I pulled up a few, but it would take too long to listen to coaches as they talk about every single video that I watched where a coach spoke. They said, if our team was not committed to unity, we could never do what we do. And it only takes one member of the team to get disgruntled, to destroy the unity of the team. It's amazing. And that's exactly what Paul was talking about. The church needs to contend as one. Perhaps Paul did not have synchronized swimming in mind when he wrote this. Maybe he had vision an illustration from Roman warfare. The Roman legions were renowned for their iron discipline. Often when under attack, they would draw very close together in one small unit, raise their large shields, and advance together as an impenetrable wall that was called the Roman wedge. It takes both skill and cooperation to advance and walk together without creating a gap where somebody could be hurt. For the church to be effective in any time or circumstance, we must live, work, and function as the family of God, willing to cooperate with each other. Let me illustrate. Fawn is going to New York this week to visit her brother, who is pastoring the church that their father started decades ago. Isn't that cool? Now, I think an appropriate team effort would be if she would send me the tickets for the Yankee baseball game that she's going to be attending, that would be working and cooperating together. <laughs> send me pictures. Just send me pictures. That's all I ask, all right, of Aaron Judge hitting a home run, all right? <clears throat> I just had to work that in somehow. <laughs> Let's let the world be the place where people quarrel and fight and divide. Because by the way, they're doing a really, really good job of it right now. So let, let's let that take place in the world. But let's, let's let the family of God, the church, be a place where we contend as one in the world. So as citizens of heaven, Paul commands that we walk worthy of the manner by walking constantly and consistently and cooperatively together. And then last of all in this passage, Paul talks about being courageous and confident. Verse 28, without being frightened in any way by those or those things which oppose you. Not to be frightened in any way. Here we see that Paul called them to remain cool, confident, and courageous in the face of opposition. Paul told them not to be frightened in any way by the opposition that comes. Don't be frightened by the visit to the doctor's office and he uses the cancer word. Don't be frightened when your boss calls you in and says, I have to let you go. 
Don't be frightened by verbal attacks of somebody who thinks your profession of faith as a Christian is foolish and stupid. This passage says, don't be frightened by any kind of opposition or adversity. The word Paul uses for frightened here is a word that's used to describe a horse that's spooked by a surprise movement in the bushes. Such a frightened horse will often rear up and run away. But you and I and our faith should not do that. In times of crisis, others may be nervous or fearful, but not the believer who has been consistent in the Word of God, in his prayer life with God, and in his fellowship with God's people. Why and how can the Christian remain confident and courageous in a time of crisis and conflict and confusion? And the answer is this, because we know the outcome of the battle. We know the final answer. We know the end of the story. Do, do you all know how the story ends? Yeah. How? We win. we win. Good. God wins. And if we're part of his family, we win. It's like the difference of watching a live football game or watching a recorded version after the fact and you already know the outcome. I remember, I remember going to see Raiders of the Lost Ark at the theater the first time. Oh, man, that might have been one of the most exciting movies I ever watched at that moment in my life. I mean, I sat on the edge of my seat. I think I even perspired during that movie. Whew, that big boulder rolling down. But you know what? I've seen that movie about 15 times, and I've ridden every one of those rides at Disneyland. And I've never gotten hurt once, and Harrison Ford comes out just fine every single time. So you know what? Now when I watch The Raiders of the Lost Ark... I kick my feet up in my lazy boy and I have popcorn. I'm not worried at all because I know how it ends. Likewise, we know the end of the story of God and we know that Christ is the victor. Our own personal story, yes, it's still being written, but if something should happen to us, we know where we're going, right? It's heaven. It's better than where we're leaving. Paul explained that when we live with confidence and courage, then we become a sign to those who don't believe. When an unbeliever sees our confidence is in Christ and our courage comes from Christ in the face of difficulty, crisis, suffering, and confusion, then they realize that we possess something that they would love to have and that they can have. When they see peace that passes understanding, when they see joy beyond human expression, when they see contentment in what? The good, pleasant things of life? No, Paul said, in each and every situation, when our friends, neighbors, and strangers see that in us, in the waiting rooms of our life, they say, how do you do that? And you tell them, I don't, but Jesus does. I know the end of the story. Do you remember how amazed and perplexed Pilate was at the calm confidence of Jesus during his arrest and interrogation? When we know that we stand with God and we know where we're going, we can be calm and confident in the face of all adversity. Jesus said in John 14, right before his first week on, worst week on earth, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Jesus promises to those who trust that they will have a peace that passes understanding. Many times in life, human understanding fails us. We do not see as God sees, but we can trust Jesus. And when we do, he gives us perfect peace. Peace in the midst of pain. Peace in the midst of grief. Peace when things go bump in the night. You see, we were inwardly fashioned for faith, not fear. Fear is not the native land of, uh, uh, of our lives. Faith is. We are made so that fear, worry, and anxiety are like pouring sand in the machinery of life, and it grinds to a halt. But faith is the oil that gets things working properly. We live better by faith and confidence than we do by fear, doubt, and anxiety. God made us that way, wired us to live by faith, not fear. Paul wanted the Philippians and us to be prepared for opposition. If no one ever criticizes or opposes us in life, if we never make waves because of our faith, if everyone is happy with our Christian faith, then perhaps there might be a little something off with our expression of our life in Christ. Or there is something wrong with their understanding of what faith is supposed to look like. You see, those who walk worthy of the gospel, on occasions we're going to annoy people. 
Now, I'm not asking you to become annoying. But sometimes to have peace in the midst of problems will annoy people. To have hope in the midst of despair will aggravate folks. Because it stands as a rebuke of everything that they live for. You see, when we say that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, folks call us arrogant. When we say that the Bible is the Word of God and it's inerrant and it is to be our direction for life and living, they call us ignorant. When we dare to say such things like sex outside of marriage is sinful, they call us narrow-minded and judgmental bigots. And so it will go on and on. We will annoy and aggravate the world precisely because we are citizens of heaven and we live by different principles. And that should enhance our joy according to the scriptures. In the book of Acts chapter 5, after a group of folks have been arrested and stood before the council of the community, the scripture says in verse 41, chapter 5, book of Acts, so they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5 and that, that Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Jesus says rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see opposition is common. The word for conflict here is the word we get agony from and Paul is saying that we share the agony of persecution together. There was someone else in it with us. So Paul's advice for us is this. Don't be afraid. Keep on speaking and living Christ. People may not like our lives or our message, but we can't let that stop us or shape us. I've struggled all morning whether to say anything or not. Um, but, but this principle right here is... See, sometimes we have to say things that people won't take well, even though it's intended for love, even though we intend to be kind. My heart broke when I, I read a headline in the newspaper this week regarding a homecoming queen at Clovis East. I don't want to be unkind to any student. But folks, we, we, we have gotten to a place where that which God says is ungodly is now acceptable. And to say anything openly is to be unkind and judgmental. Guys, I'm judging no one's eternal place in heaven only God can do that. But God tells us that actions and behavior, he says in the church, when you see a brother or sister messing up, you go to them. Is that judgment? It depends on which way you want to use the word judgment. It's not the same judgment as saying somebody's eternally damned. But God says when somebody behaves in a manner in the church, that isn't Christ-like, we are to go to them. There is some judgment on behavior that requires some conversation and some discipline. You and I are to be salt and light in a community. And somehow, and I don't have all the answers to it, we got to figure out how to not compromise the Word of God and still let people know they're loved and sometimes they'll ignore the love because they want their own ways. We've allowed our culture somehow to shape us. And even us in the pulpit, we, 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 we allow it to shape because we don't want to, we fear 
rather than be faithful. We're fearful of what others may think and we don't get a full explanation. All we get is sound bites. But we must live by faith and we must, guys, do this together. Paul told them they had been called not only to believe in Jesus, but to suffer for him by their expression of biblical truth in this world. Paul certainly practiced what he preached. Let me wrap this up. Whatever our circumstances, whether good or bad, whether easy or difficult, we must conduct ourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel, the good news of Christ. Not human accolades, but worthy of the gospel of Christ. That we are citizens of heaven. And this includes the three things we've discussed these last couple of weeks. First, worthy conduct includes being consistent. Creating those good, healthy habits that enable us to stand firm and persevere in the pressures of the world. Secondly, worthy conduct includes being cooperative, being unified and working together, inseparable as a team. And third, worthy conduct includes being confident, calm, and courageous. But none of this is possible unless we draw on our identity and we act on our identity. That is why it's important. Download Neil Anderson's Who I Am in Christ. Winston Churchill speaks to the British on the brink of facing the Germans. He said, the battle of France is over. And I expect the battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows he will have to break us on this island or he will lose the war. Let us therefore brace ourselves together to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and the Commonwealth will last for a thousand more years, men will say, this has been our finest hour. And as you and I face the adversity that comes against us, whether individually or collectively, may the world look and say, hey, for that believer, this was their finest hour. But here's what's essential. Do you remember, um, do you remember that little lion in the Lion King? Wasn't it Simba? Remember Simba? Remember towards the end of the movie, he's scared, and his buddy the baboon comes by? And what was the advice of the baboon? The baboon said to Simba, you are scared because you forgot who you were. Simba, you're scared because you have forgotten who is your father. And I say to you today, and I say to myself, if we are scared today in the face of the adversity that confronts us, then I suggest to you it's because we have forgotten who is our Father. So let's close in prayer. And if you are uncertain that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ that enables God to be your Father, then why don't you make certain of that in this closing prayer this morning? Don't let any uncertainty or doubt keep you fearful. If you are certain who your father is, but you're living like you forgot, then admit that to God. He will not punish you, but he will bring to you his peace, his joy, and his presence. Our Father, thank you that you have an ear bent towards this service today as you always do. The scripture says you are looking, 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 looking around this world for any man, woman, boy, or girl whose heart is turned towards you. And just as the prodigal father in the story of the prodigal son runs to his child, you run to us today. As you hear that prayer, Lord, I'm not sure that I'm your child, so today I'm making sure. No special formalized prayer, just an honest confession of the heart. God, I want you. God, I need you. God, I can't do this on my own. Thank you for hearing that prayer. Lord, for others in this fellowship, who most of them I know are already Christians, but maybe they've been living as if they forgot who was their father. Thank you for your grace that runs and floods into their heart at this very moment. You don't come to punish us for our forgetfulness, but you come to restore joy, peace, and contentment. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. Have a good day.